Hello. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Hi, my name is Cecily. I'm the uh, president of public health students at African Descent. Hello, everyone. I'm David Fuller, Jr. I'm the vice president. And we would just like to welcome you to our 36th annual Health Equity Conference. Yay, we have a lot of um, great, um, you know, information surrounding health equity and, um, you know, justice um, in public health that we look forward to sharing with you all. Um, before we move forward, I just wanted to, you know, give this time, oh, I'm hearing a echo. Okay, um, I just wanna, you know, um, share this time with my executive board who has spent um, countless, um, you know, time, months of planning and, you know, um, developing of this day. Um, so if we could just go down the line, you know, pretty quickly with us, you know, um, your name and a bit of your background and we'll move forward into the next component of the conference. Okay, great. So I'll come back. Like I said, I'm Cecily. I'm the president of Facade. I'm a second year HBHE, Health Behavioral Health Education Master's student, and I graduate in under a month. So yay. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone again. Yeah, David Fuller Jr. I'm a second year student in the Health Management and Policy Department, getting my MHSA, Vice President of Facade. Um, my background is listed here, and I'm excited to start my fellowship at Henry Ford Health uh, this summer. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kamara. I am a second year MPH student in health behavior and health education with a certificate in injury science. Um, professionally, I work for the Wayne County Health Department as the Deputy Chief of Emergency Preparedness and Response, and I am the Secretary of Facade. Good morning. Um, my name is Cameron Utsi. I am a second year MHI student and I graduate in about 26 days. <laughs> Hello, my name is Evan Valentine. I am a second year HBHE student and I graduate in 26 days as well. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ashley Tanksley. I'm a second year master's of public health student in the population and health sciences program. Also getting a, a certificate in tools for health policy assessment and uh, post-graduation, I'll continue my work uh, with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Awesome, awesome. Thank you guys for sharing. Um, so we just wanted to provide an overview of what the Health Equity Conference um, is and what that means. Um, and if you haven't heard, this um, program has been going on for consecutively 36 years, even in the pandemic. So even transitioning onto Zoom, um, we have like always made it our, yes, clap. But you know, yes, thank you. But we have always made it um, besides mission to, you know, just, um, you know, highlight um, and the commitment um, to educate the masses surrounding, um, you know, the different paradigms in um, public health. Um, so that being said, just, you know, as displayed on the screen, um, our purpose for the conference is to educate students, public health practitioners, researchers, and the general community about how to facilitate solutions to current health inequities present in Michigan and across the United States. Um, have participants um, leave motivated to get involved with health inequity initiative uh, organizations related to their field foster greater education and personal advocacy for public health specific health inequities, examine current public health solutions aimed at improving health equity in Michigan. And um, yes, and we'll transition into what our um, objectives for this year conference will be. So our conference theme for this year is what's next, transforming the climate of health ethics, equity, and justice in public health. Our conference topic objectives for this year is to address the historical implications of bias in healthcare and health ethics. In addition to that, we want to uncover the issues in environmental racism and solutions to change the built environment. And lastly, we want to develop upcoming leaders and advocates to systemically address racism within public health and within the larger society. And with that, we'll transition to our agenda. 
Yeah, so um, we have a very expansive agenda for us today um, as we will transition into our keynote address in a couple of minutes and then, you know, go into a 15 minute break um, to have our um, awesome panel, um, you know, uh, have a, be facilitated by um, a former facade vice president, Dorian Ballard. Um, and then we'll transition into lunch um, to have um, our second half of our um, uh, conference centered around a case discussion. Um, and networking hour facilitated by our faculty advisor, um, Dr. Dotson. And, and with that being said, um, we're going to now um, hover over into our keynote address, which will um, be introduced by our secretary, Kamara Gardner. Rakaya Yerby is the inaugural Kara J. Trout Professor in Law at Moritz College of Law and faculty affiliate of the Karen Institute at The Ohio State University. She is also the co-founder and faculty affiliate of the Institute for Healing and Justice and Equity at one of the co-founders of the Collaborative for Anti-Racism and Equity. She earned her BS in Honors Biology from the University of Michigan, MPH from John Hopkins School of Public Health, and her JD from Georgetown University Law Center. She worked at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services as an assistant region regional counsel and served as a law clerk for the Honorable Anne Claire Williams of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Court. Without further ado, introducing our keynote speaker, Rakaya Yerby. Welcome, everyone. I'm excited to be here to be able to talk to you today about hope, innovation, and transforming public health. Um, give me just a minute as I set up. Yeah. Um, and start my timer so that I can make sure that I leave enough time for lots of discussion. So I'm excited to be here today representing on the Institute for Healing Justice and Equity and the community groups that I work with. So see if I can advance the. So I'm going to need some help because it seemingly will not advance. Maybe I can do like that. There we go. Um, all right. So let me give a brief roadmap of what I'm going to do today. Um, I'm going to talk about the ways that we can transform public health. Then really dive into some of the problems with public health, particularly around public health ethics, health equity, and then end on a note about how we can uh, adopt and transform public health really by focusing on achieving health justice. So let me begin by talking about hope, innovation, and transformation. So much of the focus on public health lately has been negative. And what I want to center our attention on, at least at the beginning, is really to focus on hope and the ways that community has led us and taught us what we need to do to help people be healthy. I'm pulling from the examples of the Black Panther Party and the Young Lords who notice gaps in their community, pulled together and created a free breakfast program that now is across the country, that pulled together to create community health centers, whose model we now use at the federal level. And so what I'm trying to do is to highlight that sometimes us in the room in public health think we know better, but it's really about the community that has been disenfranchised, who can teach us how to actually move forward and support all the things that they need to be healthy. 
And so with that, I want to focus you in on health justice. We often talk about health equity and public health, but I want to move us to transformation and really talking about health justice, which I define as uh, when oppression um, and structural racism is eliminated, that racial and minority groups, that all the people featured here in this picture will be able to have their best health, not only as individuals, but as communities. And so with that, I want to turn to particular problems that we have within public health, one of them is that the main powers used primarily to discuss public health are very limited. We focus on bioterrorism, disasters, pandemics, on vaccines, when public health is so much more, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. That within public health, we are not honest about the ways that we perpetuate subordination. And I will define it a little bit later. But before I do, I want to give you specific examples of what I mean. We'll see in stories about why public health is facing a crisis. Many health departments are under attack. There's a loss of public health authority, a loss of money. And over half the states have rolled back public health powers in the pandemic. People have noted that we have an unfulfilled promise of public health. And that is in part because we limit what public health is. Public health is not just about vaccines. It's about getting people housing. It's about clean water. It's about ensuring that people are not discriminated against. It's ensuring that kids and people don't go hungry. And we have to recognize that and deal with that as we talk about public health because it is so much more. Let me move on to what I talked about earlier, which is subordination. It is a set of policies, practices, traditions, norms, definitions, cultural stories, and explanations that function to systemically hold down, systematically hold down one social group to the benefit of another social group. Now, today I'm going to talk about racial subordination, but we know there are all other forms of subordination, whether it be based on disability status on class, on gender identity, on sexual orientation. But I want to be clear that subordination influences public health associations and assumption, assumptions, like blaming racial and ethnic minorities for their poor health while allowing whites to say, oh, well, I didn't have enough time, I didn't have enough money. The same thing happens when we blame the poor for not being healthy but don't hold corporations and those with power and money responsible for the things that lead to their poor health. Now, I use this language uh, because it allows us to discuss the association between health inequities, racism, and capitalism. Most times in your classes and things we talk about, we talk about discrimination, but discrimination is so limited. It does not include all the ways that our society harms individuals and the ways that sometimes public health plays a role in that. And so let me begin to focus on particular problems within public health. Leaders reinforce the erroneous belief that racial and ethnic minority individuals are genetically inferior. Public health practices that focus on the poor lifestyle cho choices of racial and ethnic minority individuals for health inequities failure to partner with racial and ethnic minority communities to address public health issues, which ignores their autonomy while blaming them for their choices. However, we have to be clear, it's not just racial and ethnic minorities who have poor health in America. We all do because of the systems of subordination and oppression, which keep us from being healthy. I want to highlight some key examples that have happened over the past, particularly ways that we blame others, right? During COVID, the HHS chief suggested workers are to blame for COVID outbreaks at meat and poultry plants. And he suggested that the social habits and living conditions of workers at meatpacking plants were the reason for COVID-19 outbreak, 
saying that this was based in part upon things that public health officials had said. But clearly, those meat and poultry processing plant workers uh, were not the reason why their living conditions were so poor. The reason why is because we do not provide health and safe housing for individuals. The reason why is because they don't have enough money to be able to live in places that are safe. There was even a discussion blaming them for driving to these places together, and that was cause of the spread. But many of these places are in rural areas where there is no way to stay safe. There is no other way to get there. I wanna highlight another example of blaming, which was by the US Surgeon General talking about and blaming black and Latino people for inequities in COVID-19 infections and deaths saying they needed to step up by avoiding alcohol, tobacco, and drugs. Um, and we need to understand that this makes us vulnerable, as if these were the only communities and only reasons why COVID-19 was spreading. When you take a look at workplace exposure and the research done by public health officials, you actually see more of an association between workplace than between tobacco, alcohol use, and drug use. The continued forcing of people and low-wage jobs to go to those jobs without being protected by masks, without being able to wash their hands, without being able to social distance, was actually a higher rate, shown to be a higher rate of association than anything else that was mentioned by some of these public health officials. And so attributing differences in health to lifestyle choices, I want you to know is not a neutral valued language. It is a racist idea. It is a classist idea because it assigns responsibility to individuals without reference to the context of their lives. Dismissing racial patterning of power and opportunity and ignoring the toll of daily and lifelong experiences of discrimination is a form of subordination, and it is one that we often use in public health. So when we talk about public health ethics, when we talk about clarifying and prioritizing and justifying possible courses of action under public health, we must understand that our continued focus on lifestyle choices is racist, is classist, is subordination. And I just wanna highlight some ways that we do it so that we could see it and hopefully stop it. Now I pulled this from the CDC's, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention's website about chronic diseases. And some of the things that they focus, I'm sorry if it's not big enough for you, so let me just read out some of the key components of it, is that the short list of risk behaviors uh, for chronic diseases is tobacco use and exposure to secondhand smoke, poor nutrition, lack of physical activity, excessive alcohol use. And while it's important to highlight the connections between these things and poor health, what it doesn't incorporate is the reasons behind some of these poor health behaviors, which I'll talk a little bit more later. But I, what I do wanna do is that our continued focus on individuals who are using tobacco use is incorrect. Why? Because many companies have targeted, targeted racial and ethnic minorities, among others, for using tobacco use, and we do not hold them responsible for this. Research found that stores in predominantly Black neighborhoods in Washington, D.C. were up to 10 times more likely to display tobacco ads. We see the same thing in predominantly Latino neighborhoods. There are up to 10 times more tobacco ads in Black neighborhoods than in any other neighborhood. Why? Because as more educated, high-income people stop smoking, tobacco companies targeted the poor 
and racial and ethnic minorities to maintain their consumer base. And they targeted them with menthol cigarettes, which makes it harder for you to stop. Those in poverty cannot afford smoking cessation programs, while research suggests that Black people are least likely to be prescribed 8 to 12 weeks of nicotine, nicotine replacement medication or to have more than one session of counseling. And no state, even though many states received money, lots of money, from tobacco companies to stop smoking has actually provided enough money to tobacco prevention and secession services to provide the support needed to end smoking. But this doesn't even go into the reasons why people smoke. Many people smoke to address anxiety or because it does a little bit better with their mental health issues. Research has even shown when Texas got rid of their affirmative action programs, that there were increased re rates of smoking among Black youth. Smoking is just one example of how people deal with discrimination and subordination. And furthermore, just to highlight this, as states target and try to discipline individuals who continue to smoke, they continue to not use the money they were specifically given to support people to stop smoking. So when we think about individual responsibility, why do we only focus on individuals who are suffering from oppression and discrimination and not the companies who were targeting them and not the states who got money to actually try to support them? Now, let me move on to begin my discussion about poor nutrition. Poor nutrition is a big issue, but we also have to factor in that many places that are poor neighborhoods that are predominantly Black and Latino communities do not have access to good food. As you see on the slide, it shows counties in the U.S. with above average Black populations tend to have fewer fresh food options, but more convenient stores. And yet, we continue to blame those individuals for not eating healthy when they don't have access to healthy food. When we take a look at food deserts, research shows that food deserts are more abundant in residentially segregated minority neighborhoods. And as we know, residential segregation is in part, in large part due to explicit laws that allow for residential segregation that limited Black, Latinos, Native Americans access to neighborhoods that were safe, that were healthy. Overall, residential segregation has decreased in the United States, but it still remains. And residential segregation is linked to uh, poor health, increased mortality, uh, increased rates of heart disease, stroke, and blood pressure. Those are the things that we need to focus on. When we talk about physical activity, again, we often tell and go into communities and tell them, you need to move more. You need to get out and exercise. But we never take into consideration the risk that people balance by doing that, particularly Black people. If you're out running in a neighborhood, you face discrimination. You face the possibility that you could get killed. But yet, as public health officials, we continue to say, oh, go out, right? The same thing for women. Go out and be healthy. But you could be harassed right? You could be stopped. And so I just want to continue to highlight the fact that we have to change our thoughts about what we're focused on in public health. And this is a quote from uh, Dr. Rayshawn Ray, a sociologist who talks about Black men have to go through a signaling process, particularly middle-class Black men when they're trying to be physically active outside jog in well-lit places, run ahead of a partner, never behind, especially with the woman, what, that you don't wear a hoodie, right? Um, you can wear a fleece cap, all the things you have to do to try to be healthy. 
Finally, I want to hit upon uh, our thoughts around excessive alcohol use. And what we can see is that increased rates of alcohol use are associated with experiencing uh, racism. Black women smoking, alcohol consumption, and high consumption of fried meat, uh, red meat, fried foods, which are risk factors for obesity, are linked to experiences of uh, racism. And in fact, experiencing racism is linked with the odds of being a current smoker and increased rates of alcohol use for all races and ethnicities within the United States. So let me say that again, experiencing racism is associated with poor health behaviors for all races and ethnicities within this country. And that's what this uh, chart shows. The white lines actually show those who experience general racism sometimes or more. And then the black line shows healthcare racism. And while I love this, and hopefully you can see a little bit of it on the screen, it actually goes through uh, non-Hispanic Asian Pacific Islanders. It goes through non-Hispanic white, Latino, Mexican, Salvadorian, Guatemalan, Central American. So when I say that racism harms us all, it does. And that's what this chart shows, that the odds of being a current smoker increased by 24% for those who reported experiencing general racism sometimes and, and increased by 95% for those who reporting experiencing general racism often or all the time. So when we think about health promotion, and we think about healthy behaviors, we cannot just focus on trying to train people to do better because they are doing the best that they can to try to cope with subordination. So let me turn now to a discussion about health equity. We tend in public health to think about health equity, but health equity still keeps us focused on individual level issues and not on the systemic issues we need to focus on. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Many of you have seen this, hopefully. It is a social determinants of health uh, model. And it's great because it again begins to highlight what I mentioned is that public health is broader than just bioterrorism and disasters and vaccines. It is also about housing, education. But what we don't see in this diagram is the root causes of why we have differences in people's access to healthy housing. And so I decided to make a chart to try to pull in the ways that not only law is a tool for some of these problems, but the way that structural discrimination, which is one form of subordination, really impacts people's ability to be healthy. And so this model is building on the work of social epidemiologists, where instead of just putting the circle, I uh, focused on systems. You'll note that public health is one of the systems because we do impact people's ability to be healthy, as I just showed you. Our continued focus on health promotion and blaming individuals limits our ability to actually focus on the structural problems and subordination that prevent people from being healthy. So in this picture, you'll note that there is a green uh, parentheses around the areas that we currently focus on. We tend to focus on the systems. Uh, we don't tend to focus on the things that I think we should also should, which is the ways that subordination and the ways that law structure our systems and ways to keep people from being able to be healthy. And let me be clear about public health. We should say that it keeps populations and communities from being healthy, right? Because that is our focus. And so I'm gonna spend uh, the rest of my time talking about um, that focus of structural discrimination, particularly structural racism, and the ways that it structures systems and keeps people and communities from being healthy. 
but there are lots of definitions of structural racism. So I want to define for you what I'll be talking about for the rest of today. It's the ways that practices, policies, and laws are used to structure systems, including the healthcare system to advantage white individuals and disadvantage racial and ethnic minority individuals. And I can plug in structural sexism, structural classism, structural ableism. Today, I'm gonna focus on structural racism, but know that this could be applied across different identities. It's also the ways that organizations work together to create separate and unequal and independent barriers through the neutral denial of equal treatment that results from the normal operations of organizations in a society. It does not require bad intent and know that organizations could mean trade organizations. It includes governmental departments, officials. Um, it's the ways that we operate sometimes together to limit people's access to the things that they need. So I'm going to give you some specifics on what I mean by structural racism, particularly in the public health context. <clears throat> Most of my examples are from COVID just because um, that is most present in people's minds. And I think it is quite clear that at COVID, uh, there were lots of issues uh, around structural racism that kept people in their communities from being able to be healthy. I show this picture here of Raina Zoe. Mugman, who was not able to get um, a COVID-19 test. Many Black, Latino individuals were denied access to testing and COVID-19 treatment um, during the pandemic. And as communities began to try to address this, they began to put in place some things that ensured that those who were most impacted would actually get the care that they needed. In fact, New York recently adopted the use of the CDC Social Vulnerability Index to ensure the worst off receive equal access to a treatment. This index includes 15 factors, which includes socioeconomic status and race. In response to the New York adopting this, a Cornell law professor sued New York over racial discrimination, saying that the inclusion of race was discriminatory, even though New York specifically said why they were trying to adopt this because they had failed to provide equal and equitable care to racial and ethnic minorities. Minnesota and Utah, also try to adopt something that would give people equitable and equal care. They decided to scrap it because they were called by conservatives and threatened with lawsuits. Now, why is this important? Because in Minnesota, whites have the lowest incidence, incidence of COVID-19 cases compared to Blacks, American Indian, Alaska Natives, and whole Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders. But because, but because the protocols have been scrapped, treatment for COVID-19 will not be distributed equally to those who are disproportionately harmed. So again, power and law are being used to disproportionately disadvantage racial and ethnic minorities who are most impacted. And I would be remiss if I didn't highlight my lovely state of Michigan and the things that have happened. Now, I do wanna say that throughout my time during COVID, I tried my best to highlight all of the great things that Michigan did in response to COVID. But one of the most glaring instances of subordination for me outside of my state of Missouri, because there were lots of glaring instances there, was the fact that the Michigan, that some legislatures in the Michigan Senate issued a plan that would have barred the state from using residents, race, and socioeconomic status to guide distribution of COVID-19. And they did this 
after a report came out that said white residents get the COVID-19 vaccine at twice the rate of African-Americans. So intentionally knowing that there's already a disproportionate distribution of vaccines, they wanted to further harm those individuals. And let's be clear, they didn't just focus on racial and ethnic minorities, they were also focused on the poor. Thankfully, that didn't move forward, but it shows us once again how subordination happens, that we don't have equal access to the things we need. And in here, this slide just shows again how some North Carolina Latinos uh, were turned away and sent home from hospitals in Indianapolis. Uh, they were turned away. They were asked uh, for identification to get vaccines, which was specifically uh, not required by the government. Let me turn now to this discussion about housing. Now, I talked about residential segregation before, but I want to come back to it specifically to talk about the ways that there that it impacts and harms racial and ethnic minorities. There's less economic investment and fewer resources, such as uh, places to exercise or play, which are associated with higher rates of cardiovascular disease um, and risk for Black women. There's more pollution, noise, and overcrowded housing stock. Furthermore, there's lack of access to clean water, and not just in our urban areas, but also in, uh, in areas where indigenous individuals live. Tribes without clean water, um, that there's an estimated one in 10 indigenous Americans who lack access to safe tap water or basic sanitation, without which a host of health conditions, including COVID-19, diabetes, and gastrointestinal diseases are more likely. And in fact, when we look at lack of access to clean water, we see that it is predominantly in racial and ethnic um, minority neighborhoods and in rural areas. Almost half a million American households lack bas basic indoor plumbing with renters and people of color in some of the county's, country's wealthiest and fastest growing cities more likely to be living without running water. We saw stories of this in San Francisco. Uh, there is actually uh, a new story that showed a building, an older building in San Francisco uh, where um, it was predominantly Asian individuals living there. The toilet, they had one toilet uh, for multiple apartments that usually didn't work. So one woman had a potty in her, uh, in her apartment that you would use to potty train people. And that's where they went to the bathroom. Right. So when you're telling people to be healthy and they don't have access to water, that's not really going to work. Um, and it's not what we should be doing as public health officials. Um, let me talk a little bit about employment as well. Some companies have used prior salary history to pay racial and ethnic minorities and women less than white men. Evidence also shows that companies channel channeled racial and ethnic minority individuals into lower paid careers, particularly, particularly in the tech industry for Asian individuals. We often say to people that it's your responsibility to negotiate for a higher salary, but what the research shows is that Black job seekers were penalized for trying to negotiate equal or higher salaries than their white counterparts. And um, they are expected to negotiate less than their white counterparts. So listen to what I'm saying. In the United States, where we say everybody should be paid equal for equal work, you will be penalized for trying to earn the same as someone else. And we know most times you're doing more work than everybody else and getting paid less than everybody else. And this holds true for women as well. There was a study that actually compared white women and black women together. 
and they saw that black women did more work and earned less. Uh, Professor Tristan Green finds that some employers change standards to highlight the qualities of men versus women. If men have degrees, then education is important. But if women have degrees, then education is not important. It's more about how you work well with others. This can explain why educational attainment does not work for women and people of color because we continue to violate the law and change our standards based on who we want to hire. Now, of course I have more, but I'm gonna keep going and talk about how this connects to health outcomes. There's gender disparity and depression and anxiety disorders when women earn less than their male counterparts, which was substantially reduced when women earn more or similar to their male counterparts. Experiencing discrimination at work has been associated with high job stress, post-traumatic stress for Black women, and also been associated with higher rates of infant mortality. But when we think about public health, do we ever mention any of this when we're talking about issues about maternal and child health? No. And so I want to spend the rest of my time, which I think is about 25 minutes, Two minutes, uh-oh, okay. Well, can I get five? Okay, maybe seven, and I'll wrap it up. I'll wrap it up. Because I want to end on a positive note, right? So I've spent all this time talking about the negative, and here you can show an example of it. Uh, but I want to talk about health justice. So to me, health justice means that we must be truthful and allow for a process that allows people to overcome their trauma, that we must let impacted communities drive and lead the change, uh, and that we must provide financial supports for the things uh, to help people. And so I put up my model earlier, this is how it fits together, right? That we must be truthful and honest about subordination, structural discrimination that happens, we must uh, have community drive the structural change. So they must be a part of making the laws, enforcing the laws, and we must provide financial supports. And so what does that look like? Um, it requires honesty about racism in public health. As I just mentioned, there are lots of examples acknowledges that racial and ethnic minority individuals continue to be blamed for poor health outcomes when there are structural issues. That when we name racism as a public health crisis, that we recognize that we are part of that problem, that it impacts everybody. And so it's not just about focusing on all the ways that racism impacts racial and ethnic minorities. It harms everybody, women of color, LGBTQIA. It, it saps the strength, as Kamara, Dr. Kamara Jones says, it saps the strength from all of society. We must provide opportunities for racial and ethnic minority individuals to tell public health officials about the harms they've suffered, we must provide therapy and restorative practices for those who are harmed, but that's not enough. Those who are harmed need to be uh, the transformation in their lives because they know what they need. And governments must provide money and access to health care for individuals who have been harmed. So with that, I want to end and just provide a couple of additional readings that my work is based on, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Professor Yerby. Um, we're going to transition into a question and answer panel. Um, so um, no questions yet in the chat, I believe. So um, we'll just, you know, let that sit for a while. But if there are any um, questions in the audience, um, we have um, a mic runner going around. So uh, feel free. Um, yes. Uh, good morning. So you're Good morning. Thank you for your presentation. Um, you had mentioned at the beginning of your uh, presentation 
as to how public health has been given a negative light in terms of the perceptions of what they do. What is being done for those students, new students that be coming into the public health sector and what would encourage them to, to move further despite some of the insights that are, being, that are out there regarding public health? Um, so thank you for that question. Um, so as you mentioned, I mentioned that uh, public health is under attack, but there is a lot of great work being done by public health officials to help people. And I think we need to not only raise that up, support the students, but also train them in a different way. As I mentioned, we tend to only focus on public health as this very limited thing, um, instead of looking at how broad it is and how much it contributes to our overall health and well-being, right? So when we think about Biden passing a bill uh, to put money back in the community, to me, that's public health because that's putting money back into a community, a population to support their health and well-being. We need to champion that. We need to champion the things that we have done that support people's health and well-being. Um, like I said, the community health, uh, the community health um, centers, the free breast program, the fact that so many people during COVID-19 got money and food, to me, that is public health. And so I think we have to talk about it differently, support the people who are doing this work, and highlight all the great things that they are doing. But we need to shift our frame so that when we go into communities, it's not to teach them to do better. They need to teach us because they have been doing so much that we have not supported them on. Um, so I think those are a few things. Thank you for that. Um, I want to take a moment to acknowledge our people that we have joining us online for the live stream. Um, a question that they put for you um, is what are some ways in which health care systems can support public health work and address structural inequities in the communities that they support? So one of the ways to me that healthcare systems can support the communities and public health work is to understand that they are an employer, that they have lots of power and lots of money, and they can help people be healthy. Um, and so one of the things that I talk to healthcare systems about and ask them about is, how much are you paying all your workers? And I'm not just talking about the doctors and nurses, I'm talking about the people that provide uh, food, that are janitors, all of those. Have you outsourced that? Just because you outsourced it did not mean that you didn't retain power over ensuring that they have equal wages. And so there's a hospital in Cleveland, where they actually uh, decided that everybody who was employed at that hospital, regardless of whether they were independent contractors or not, would have access to health care. To me, that is something you should do. Most hospitals were in neighborhoods that had poor housing, and then they bought it up. But what did they use it for? They didn't help the community that was there. They could have helped the community that was there and they should help the community that was there. Hospitals have big spaces. Um, they tend to have gift shops in their hospital. Why don't they have barbershops? Why don't they have places where people from the community could actually work? Those are all things that hospitals have the power to do to continue to build the community and support the people that are there. That's some of the things that they should do. Awesome. Thank you for that. Are there any further questions in the audience? Okay, we do have another question from the, um, our live stream um, guests. Um, this question states, what are some suggestions for how to effectively build power in public health spaces to address the disproportionate impact of politics in implementation of policies to address health and wellness in communities? Um, so I think what you said uh, was that the question is, how do you build power? Uh, to be able to change, particularly as politics continues to impact public health. Okay, great. Um, so to me, we tend to focus only on one aspect of politics, right? So we'll look at the legislature and maybe the courts. That's not where all power lies. 
power lies close and power lies where the money is, right? And so you need to go to where the money is and where the decisions are being made. Let's be honest. The decision is not being made by the legislature. The decision was already made before the legislature got there. So the key is to find those pressure points that power that money and see if you can make those changes. I also have to say in this country, we no longer abide by the rule of law. So the fact that we continue to try to press around that, no, we need to do what is necessary to support people. And that means being on the ground, doing what you need to do to ensure that that happens. It doesn't necessarily always mean going to the legislature. It means sometimes going to the person who's in the community who has the most money and getting them to do the thing that is right. Whether that means protesting, setting up a meeting, getting close to them, so that you can get the money that you need uh, to be able to do it. So I guess what I'm saying is, is that we need to take a holistic approach because the people who we are fighting against have taken a holistic approach. They don't just look at the legislature. They are on the ground using their money and their power to change stuff, and we need to do it as well. And the last thing I would say is when we get power, we can't just stand up and give nice lectures. We actually have to change the system. So although you see me here today, you see me in other places giving lots of lectures. I, as an employer and as a manager, um, model the things that I say need to happen. Um, that might not get on the news, but it helps the people that I can help and ensures that they get the money that they need so they, they can survive. And so that's another way to shift uh, the ways that things are happening. Thank you for that. We have a question in the audience. We're going to take real quick. We have another one up here, I believe. Hi, I was wondering if there's examples um, across the world or maybe even within the U.S. of locations that have done a good job of integrating public health, social justice and equity. And what can we learn from the ex these examples? That is a fabulous question. Um, Honestly, I can't give you any that have been effective. I can give you some that have tried. Um, so let me give you some that have tried and let me tell you why we still need to push further. So there are lots of communities that have uh, focused on racial inequities. When you look at King County in Washington, when you look at Seattle and the state of Washington, when you look at particular places, they have made racial equity a priority. The problem is, is that while they have done that, they have not changed their economic system they are still economically conservative, and they haven't actually given the power to individuals and communities to drive the change. And so, yes, we have moved forward in a sense of adopting racial equity tools, of really championing it. They actually, in Seattle, which is impressive, is that when they do accounting and budgeting, they after they pass laws like increasing the minimum wage, they actually audited it to see how how it impacted different racial and ethnic minorities differently to see if it was actually leading to change. The problem is, is that if you just try to make little small changes within the same system, it is not going to work. We have to transform our systems and be willing to let go of the power that we have uh, because in the end, it will help all of us. And so, yes, there have been shifts and movements, um, I say, in this country and in some other, um, in this country and in some other countries. But the key is, is that you cannot actually move to true transformation and social justice if only a small group of people control all the money and the power in the world, right? And so I'm heartened by what Seattle and King County have done. I'm heartened by California, which is trying to think about reparations. Um, you see in Evanston, them doing reparations. I think in Asheville, North Carolina, they're trying to do that. In Providence, Rhode Island, they have moved to truth and reconciliation. But we need to do more in terms of shifting power and shifting money. Thank you for that. And I believe 
do we have one more question in the audience? All right. Thank you. Okay. I'll, can you hear me? Okay. So I work in the medical field. So I know there is a lot of inequities with that. Um, you know, we don't have enough. Well, we don't have whole foods usually in the hood. <laughs> you know, like you said, if we are out trying to run, you have to be very careful. That talk for our teenagers is not about sex. Is that talk about keeping your hands at 10 and 2 when the cops stop you? But anyway, I, I am an RN and is the public health service thinking about the grassroots of the people? Did you ever think about um, speaking to them in ways that they could help themselves stay healthy, even though the powers that be? don't want us to and don't give us that much power to there are things that we can do that i think the public health uh, systems should think about when you're thinking about grassroots people yeah and i would um i hear your question about um can we use our power to educate communities. And I would uh, change it a little bit to say, can we get the money and the power to let communities um, lead the change? And so one of the ways that I have seen that is that there is actually a Black company that goes out and works with communities on planting that gives them seeds, um, right? Is that continuing to support them? When we think about um, indigenous communities who are using their own medicine and putting it together with Western medicine to come up with something that will be best for their communities, right? And so how I frame it is what public health needs to do is to go into communities, list Listen, support those leaders to be able to do the work that supports their communities. And let me be clear about this. It doesn't mean going in and paying a prematoria or community health worker from that community um, until your grant runs out. It means going in and actually supporting the people who are doing this as their third and fourth job so that they can do this for the rest of their lives, right? It's putting money in that community so it pays to help your community be healthy instead of only doing it on the side, right? And so, yes, there are ways that we could do that. I'll give you an example. You didn't ask for an example, but I'm gonna give you an example of how I try to run my grants is that I partner with communities, I hear what they're doing, and I give them money to keep doing it. And then I figure out what gaps they need, whether it's technology or more people, and continue to give that money to them to do that. And then mention their name at every place that I'm at, Homes for All, Eat Hot Street Democracy, Greensboro Health Disparities Collaborative. So more people will give them money to continue to do the amazing work that they are doing. So yes, I think public health can do that, but we need to change our frame and funders need to change their frame to continue to fund those people and not necessarily me, sorry, researchers, but to fund those people to keep their communities healthy. We are at time. Can we give Professor Yerby another hand, round of applause? 